Dear Lord, we thank, I thank you that we can link together today. Just thank you that we can link together freely. And I just pray that as, as I share the things that you put on my heart about God's tent and the tabernacle, I just pray that you just reveal the things you want to reveal and just take my words and unravel them and, and, and help, help people to fathom them out. And I just pray that you would impact people today. Just impact people with your word and your very presence. I ask this is in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, in the last few few weeks, we've been um, working through e- Exodus, and so we we, we had had a, a session on um, God's messenger um, Moses, and when he was called in the burning bush, and all that followed. Um, we bought, we also had a, a, a session on um, God's law. And all the various um, sort of requirements and perhaps sensible ways of, of living. We had an, uh, we had another preach on um, God's covenant and the giving out of the law and the the covenant that was agreed. This happened um, on the, as a result of several trips up up and down Mount Sinai, and it was primarily Moses. It was Moses who was sort of the media who was the the person on the receiving end of all of these various instructions. And so um, today we kind of pick up the story then. Um, what's perhaps not instantly obvious is Moses has been up Mount Sinai, God had confirmed the covenant, and then about 40 days had passed, and he, Moses was still sort of in God's presence. And then at this point, this is where God starts giving him instructions about the tabernacle. So I'm going to pick the story up in Exodus 25, um, um, verses 1 to 8. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver and bronze, blue, purple and scarlet yarn and, and linen, goat hair, Ram skins dyed red and hides of sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and oinks, stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastplate. Then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I'll show you. And Exodus um, 25 through to 30 gives quite an involved account, in some detail actually, of all the various aspects of the tabernacle and, and the priests, the garments and the construction. I'm not proposing to read through those chapters, so I'm going to kind of talk to it a bit and draw various things out of it. There's also quite a good description also in Numbers 28 and 29 that cover much the same thing but covering slightly different different points. So those are the two sets of verses if you wanted to go and read more about it. Now perhaps to sort of to kick off, what was what was the purpose of God wanting this tabernacle or this sort of portable tent? Um, of meeting to be put together and r- r- fundamentally it was to be a place that God could meet with his people where people could sort of feel the sort of tangible presence of God amongst them and to be led with, by him and to meet with him and in truth when you look at it in the Bible there are not many times when God sort of caused or God asked or allowed a sort of a dwelling place to be made for him. And really, you know, I can only see two or three references to when, when that actually happened. So we have a sense of the presence of God with man in Genesis before the fall of man. So that, that, there's a definite reference to God being present amongst his people there. Um, Exodus certainly tells us of this desire of God to have a place that he can dwell amongst his people and that resulted in Moses setting up the tabernacle along with all the people and stuff. Um, 
in fact, it's not even on my list, but um, Solomon was sort of very much felt on it. Uh, David felt on his heart. He wanted to actually build a more permanent dwelling for God. And, he, and in fact, it was his son Solomon that built a temple. And God very much allowed that. He didn't allow David to build it, but he, he said, well, actually, it will be your son that will be build the dwelling place. So fairly limited n- numbers of times that this concept of God dwelling amongst the people was actually entertained, really. In the New Testament and beyond, it's a bit of a different story because it's, it's a new, we're into the new covenant where God actually dwells in our hearts and amongst us as, and because of what G- Jesus has done. So it becomes a, a different arrangement. But those, those, in terms of the Bible, are pretty much the only references I find to God dwelling amongst his people. So very much the purpose, God to be amongst his people, to be known by them to be, and, to, and to lead them. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the, of the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. So first of all, there was, a very, there was an outer courtyard and I, I can't remember exactly how big it is, but imagine something like a football pitch, enough space for a good number of people to sort of congregate if need be. Um, in this outer, outer courtyard, the priests would uh, make um, offerings, burnt offerings unto the Lord. There were the whole mixture of different offerings, free will offerings. Some were as a result of some of the festivals which the Lord um, commanded them to, to carry out. Very much centred around um, making sort of atonement for sin um, because... It, it, was, it featured very much in the operation of the whole of this tabernacle and all of the structure that sin had to be atoned for. There was no way God was going to be present with his people or the priesthood unless they, they were properly sorted out and, and right with God. And, and under this regime of the old covenant, it all had to be done with sacrifice. And so in this outer courtyard um, was where these various sacrifices and stuff were made. Um, there was also a basin, which is used for ceremonial washing, really, by the priests, because there was an outer courtyard and then there was a tent where only the priests could go into. Mm-hmm. And so before they could go into that tent, apart from these burnt offerings being made, there had to be a sort of ceremonial washing of themselves and cleansing before they could go even into the tent. So that, that also featured in this outer courtyard. Now, continuing with the theme of the structure then, we move into the tent of God's presence. Now, this, this tent um, was in two parts. There was sort of the, the first section that the priests would go into um, There was a first section that the priests could go into, but then there was the inner sanctuary, as it was called, the Holy of Holies, where only the high priests could go into. So I'll talk first about the holy place, as it was called, the first area within the tent. Now, there, were, there was a seven-branch lampstand in there, and there were um, oil lamps that were lit on a daily basis in the evening and I guess they were left to burn until they they ran out of steam type of thing and there was very much sort of ritual and ceremony around the trimming of the wicks and and sort of preparing the lamps keeping them filled up with oil there's a lot more about that in the various bible references I mentioned earlier I'm not going to dwell on that can I just say that's the wicks you burn on the night the dead night my father Oh, the lamp. We keep it alive. Oh, I see. Yeah, my mum gets very upset when she gets her light. She goes once a week and it's, it's oh, gone see, out. So it's got to be kept, kept to alive. Kept alive. Okay. Um, Thank you. Mm-hmm. Moving on, in this outer, in this first section again, there's also the table of, table. it's known as the table of, of the bread of presence. Um, each Sabbath... Twelve loaves would be placed into this onto this table, one from each of the tribes of Israel, and I believe they also had frankincense put on them as well. Um, there's more about that than to d- 
detail really in Leviticus 24 verses 5 to 9. I'm not proposing to read that now. Um, very importantly, also in this sort of outer part of the tent um, was the altar of incense. Now this was immediately in front of the curtain that was sort of the, the, sort of the division between the holy place and the most holy place, the inner sanctuary if you will. Now incense was burned morning was was burned morning and evening, and it was, it was a ceremony around that and continuing that happening. Um, let's read that bit, Exodus thirty seven to ten. Let's look at that. Aaron must burn frank, fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight. So incense will burn regularly before the Lord for, the, for generations to come. Do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering, and do not pour a drink offering on it. Once a year, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns. The annual atonement has been made with the blood of the atoning sin offering for the generations to come. It is most holy to the Lord. There are a couple of things about this sort of incense and this altar of incense. It's, it's been suggested that in some ways that represents the prayers of the saints, um, which is you know, one, one interpretation of it. The other th way of look, the other thing to see about this is obviously it, cr it created a sort of an atmosphere, a mist, which is a bit like on Mount Sinai, in a way, when God's presence came down. That first of all, there was a cloud, so that people really didn't fully see God. And if you can picture the scene in this sort of tent, the whole of the inside of this holy place, and indeed the inner sanctuary, would have been sort of wafting with all of this sort of incense. So, yeah, there's a lot of symbolism in that. And elsewhere we read that this was a pleasing aroma to the Lord as well. Uh, moving on, I'm going to move into the most holy place now. Most importantly, it was separated by with a curtain. It, you weren't going to go in there accidentally. And believe you me, you really didn't want to. Um, it, it, God made it quite clear that, if, in fact, nobody could even go into the tent of the holy place willy-nilly without con severe consequences. And certainly the most holy place, only the high priest was allowed to go in there. And initially that was um, Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, who was um, appointed as, uh, as the high priest. Um, he's, uh, he was only allowed to go in there once a year. Um, and this was to make the sort of final atonement for sin for all the people. Um, and it was a risky business as well. And from what I've read elsewhere, the, you picture the scene... He, you know, he, even though he the, the, he was a priest, um, you, you couldn't just assume his sins were all covered. There's a whole load of stuff and ritual that had to be done in proper order before God would tolerate anybody coming into his presence like that. It was a really big deal. And I'm going to say some more about that a bit later on. Now, once we managed to get into that in a sanctuary beyond the curtain... Um, what the, the only thing in there really was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this had the stone tablets which were given to Moses with the Ten Commandments. It also, I believe, had the law that was written down by Moses. So, as God revealed all these various um, rules and regulations, which we heard about a couple of weeks ago, um, yeah, that was written down, that was also in there. Um, the golden jar of manna. And this was from some of the initial journey through the desert where God used manna and quail to feed the Israelites. And there was a, a, a one jar of it was preserved apparently, and that was in there. And also we had Aaron's rod, which I forget the detail, but at one point it budded. And I think it was partly to confirm his position as the high, high priest. Um, 
again, um, talking about the Ark then, this is in the Holy of Holies, in the Inner Sanctuary, um, there was a lid, there was a lid on top of that Ark, and there were two cherubim on top of it, and they were huge, I, I forget the detail, I think they were something like sort of six or eight feet wide each of them, enormous great things. Now, the lid of the Ark, it was also known as the mercy seat. Mm. Now, perhaps the way to look at it, this is that the cherubim and the mercy seat together formed a throne for God to, to, to well, God, the invisible God, to actually be present in that sanctuary. In a way, you could think of it perhaps the, his feet would be on the standing on the cover of the ark. The mercy seat, if you like, but maybe it's better to think of him as actually sitting on it as a throne. So it's a kind of a lovely picture of how God would would meet with the high priest. It was the mercy seat because really it was atonement for sin. God was being merciful on the sins that you know, would have otherwise resulted in death. A uh, few more points to, around this. The cherubim, rather interesting. They're often, in sort of ancient times, viewed as protectors guarding property or, or important uh, buildings or, th or thrones, that type of thing. Now, the curtain separating the holy place and the most holy place, the inner sanctuary, that had two cherubim on it. And they were actually embroidered in, into the curtain. Um, there were also two cherubim on top of the ark. Now remember, I'm saying these are kind of protectors. They're almost like, a, in fact, they're more of a warning to the people. Actually, don't, you go, don't want to go for, beyond this point without thinking of the consequences. Certainly you couldn't go and mess about. Nobody was allowed to lift the top of the ark and mess about in there. And certainly, even for the high priest, he couldn't just rock up and go into the inner sanctuary. It was a, under a, ceremony, a specific ceremony, Day of Atonement ceremony that he was allowed to do that. So very much a warning. Um, it's side sidebar, really. Um, cherubim also are mentioned in the story of the Garden of Eden and the fall of man. So after the fall of man, God actually put cherubim to guard the way back to the tree of the life. It's all very symbolic, but it's connected in... You know, it was there as a warning or to, to stop people inadvertently going further than they should. Lovely symbolism, but it has some pretty deep meaning in there. Now, one thing I just sort of read um, found really interesting is the structure of this temple. You know, the outer courtyard, the, the sort of tent where you had the bit that the priests could minister in, and then the most holy of holies where the high priest could go into almost a replica of what happened on Mount Sinai, which I've found really, really interesting. Um, the, but basically, with Mount Sinai, the people were only allowed to could go no further than the foot of the mountain. It's a bit like the outer courtyard. Um, so I just want to read these as I describe it. So this is Exodus 24, verses 1 and 2. Get a look at it. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance. So they were coming up the mountain, but they weren't to go too far up. That was kind of the premise here. Uh, but you are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. So basically the people were not allowed to, to approach. Now, move, now moving on, I want to read Exodus 24, 9 to 18. It tells us a little bit more about this. Moses, Aaron, Nadab and Abi, I can't pronounce it, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. And under his feet was something like a pavement, made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against his leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, 
come up to me on the mountain and stay here. Now this is instruction to Moses only. So you picture the scene. The elders have gone so far up the mountain along with Moses and then God is calling Moses alone to go further on. Come up to me on the mountain and stay here and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commands I've written for their, their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up the mountain of God and said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you and anyone involved in the dispute can go to them. Now when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So... Kind of what I'm getting at is a sort of a tiered approach. The people could go up to the mountain, the elders and, and I suppose the people who later were made into made priests were able to go a little bit further up and probably enveloped in the cloud. But it was actually Moses alone and it says Joshua also was allowed to go with him. It was only those two that could actually go up to the summit, which is kind of the equivalent of meeting in the Holy of Holies. So very similar structure and we've got the incense in the tent of meeting versus the sort of cloud that God had sent over Mount Sinai. So all pretty amazing stuff. Now, in terms of the actual use then of the tabernacle, um, I'm not going to go into any detail really on it, but um, there were various offerings and sacrifices regularly made by the priests. We certainly had daily burnt offerings for sin being made in there. Um, and that's that you can read more about that in Exodus 29, 38 to 46. And then on top of on top of that, there were various holy days and festivals. So the key ones are the Sabbath. So every Saturday there would there would there would be um, various specific offerings that would be made and and sacrifices made on the back of it. We've got the Feast of Weeks, which is pretty much as, as harvest started. So the first fruits, the first offerings would be brought to the Lord. And my understanding is all, is all the people were expected to bring some sort of offering. That's, so now you start to understand why they needed a tabernacle a courtyard the size of a football pitch, because of a whole load of stuff going on for it. Um, then there's also the Feast of Tabernacles, which is really at the end of the far harvest when everything has been brought in. Um, so there's a big um, festival for that. And later on, I believe it was also used to remember perhaps the wanderings of the people for 40 years in the desert when really they got the wrong end of the stick and they kept doubting God. And, and, that, and it took 40 years before they could enter the Promised Land. And I read somewhere that this feast also kind of remembers that. So when it talks about the harvest being gathered in, it also remembers that, you know, after that period of wandering, they eventually came home to Canaan and to the Promised Land. Um, do check it all out. This is my kind of what I've gleaned from, from reading. And really the culmination of all of this very stuff that went on, if you remember... As I said before, that there's this need for sins to be covered. So it starts off with, with, really with the priests. They need to get their own sins covered before they could even minister. Yeah. And then out of all of that, then the high priest, who's sort of set apart from the priests themselves, then goes in to make the final um, atonement before the Lord. Now this, this was handled with a festival again. It's called the Day of Atonement. Um, and this was a role only for the high priest. And just to get a sense of how involved and, and, and important this was, I'm going, to, I'm going to read some verses on this. This is Leviticus 16, 2 to 17. So 
So Leviticus 16, 2 to 17. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die, because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area, with a young bull for, his, for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on a, the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and to put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering and to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it as a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household, and he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and with his finger sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanliness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins had been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting which is among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement for the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household and the whole community of Israel. Now apologies, it was, that was quite a long read, but I just kind of wanted to get across how involved all this was, you know. It's often struck me, we can sometimes trivialise sin and what it cost, you know, what, you know, what it meant for God to, 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 to provide a way to cover sin. Now this was the old covenant, the old regime, and it was incredibly involved. There was a whole, it's all probably a reverent word to use, a whole load of paraphernalia, frankly. I mean, there were, there were the whole tribe of the Levites was set aside to, to, for the whole fun, proper functioning of this sanctuary um, and the tabernacle. Um, it wasn't just sort of the running of it, keeping it intact and, and do, get doing all these various ceremonies. It is also it had to be a portable tabernacle. So there's a whole bunch of people whose job it was to sort of pack things up in a proper fashion and to move it um, as, as the Israelite community moved. But... Um, yeah, I it yeah it just it just hit home very hard to me just how involved all of this was and and really I don't think God would have said all of this stuff had to be done unless that was necessary in order for Him to be present amongst His people. That's kind of what it took. I, I'm, for this last section, I want to kind of move on to talk about. Um, how this all relates to our life in Christ, mm. because it's we often talk about the new covenant in Christ, and um, this is very much the, the old covenant. All this stuff was done to kind of cover people's sin, but it it kind of 
didn't take the sins fully away. The big problem was that this, all these rituals and ceremonies would go on and on again, but the same old stuff would come up. The, the sort of the heart of the matter, if you like, the, the heart of rebellion wasn't really changed. It was just every time they messed up, they would come and make an offering, and it was all very much a ritual. So I want to, to read <coughs> Hebrews 8, 1 to 13, which really talks about how the new covenant in, in God, in Jesus, replaces the old. So let me just read that. Hebrews 8, um, 1 to 13. The point of what we're saying is this. We do not have a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Sorry, I said it wrong, didn't I? <laughs> we do have a high, such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build a tabernacle See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And it is, and it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has also made, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and ageing will soon disappear. Now, yeah, two things in there which really stood out to me. Um, verse 6 tells us that Jesus' ministry is superior to that performed by the high priest under the old covenant. And the fi that final verse stating that the old covenant is made obsolete by the new covenant. We kind of need to get hold of that, you know, that we live by the spirit. It isn't by the letter of the law because they tried that and it kind of didn't work. You know, they're lucky if they managed one generation of, of, of leadership under, under the various kings that are talked about in the Bible before things went there to again. So it's very key that he would write that by the Spirit, he would write his law on our hearts. Um, I appreciate time is just about gone, but please indulge me with just a few more verses. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And I'm also going to read 9 and 10, where it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God 
that, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And it's those words talking about us being built into, into, into like living stones into a spiritual house. It's as if, it's as if what um, was being made in this tent of meeting and perhaps later in Solomon's temple, God is building in our hearts, in our hearts as he builds us into a, into a spiritual temple. Um, it, and I also like the words where it talks about us being a holy priesthood, holy nation, declaring others our praise to God. Um, really, that's to me is speaking of what God had re- under the old covenant had intended for Israel to do, that they would be the mouthpiece of God, showing, um, declaring his praises to the wider world. He's saying that in the new covenant, that role is now or now with us as we've been built into this holy temple, um, spiritual temple, if you will. And it's all by the work of the Holy Spirit and Jesus working in us. But that ro- that role is fully with us now um, as, as he moves on our hearts and moves us. And the, th- the thing that... It, the, the, the amazing thing, obviously, about what Jesus has done is we don't have to go to a priest and then a high priest in order to get to God. He has opened the way and he's done it once and for all. And that's what I think the words in Hebrews really bring alive. It was also mentioned, it was also covered in the call to worship, Hebrews 9, that I just read earlier. Um, overall conclusion for me is... It's very clear that God does desire to be present and dwell amongst us and for us to know him. Um, the thing that really st- has stood out by I me mean, reading through all this stuff is, is the ugliness of sin really and how it so much derails what God wants to do with us. But amazingly, God has provided the solution and he, he, knows, he knew that we couldn't sort it all out ourselves and that's why he's given, he's given us Jesus. Jesus has performed the ultimate sacrifice and we really need to get a hold of that and just be th- thankful to God about it really. Um, amazing thing to have done. When I picture all these thousands of people and there's this whole load of stuff going on around the tabernacle and it was only partly successful really all of that and yet Jesus has done it and he's done it all once and for all and so we've got so much to be thankful for. Now I've spoken for far too long and so thanks for bearing with me but um, I, Beth, Bethany had passed to me a poem she wrote about the tabernacle and it was written in her late teens actually and I think you've heard enough of my voice, so I'm going to ask, invite Bethany perhaps to read it, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. The tabernacle. Hey Moses, said the Lord one day, come up the mountain and talk to me. You'll be with me 40 days, but don't bother to bring your tea. In my sight, you have gained favour and your name I know so well. I've called Israel my nation, and with him I'm going to dwell. Next day, Moses started walking up the hill with stony ground. As he reached the top, he stopped in awe, for God's glory was all around. The next 40 days, God talked with him, his faithful and trusted friend. What you must do is follow the pattern that I've established and will never end. You live in tents, and I want one. It'll be the biggest of them all. You will call it a tabernacle, and it'll be ten cubits tall. It's width and length as a football pitch, but inside that game do not play, because instead there will be sacrifices offered up all the day. On the altar, cows will be killed. For all your sins, they must be slain. The blood is needed as a cover to pay for all your shame. But one day, I'll send a lamb to pay the price for everyone. On the cross, there he'll die. His name, Jesus, my only son. Next will come the water basin, because I can't stand smelly feet. Sacrifice and washing hands means that then we can meet. 
But one day I'll do away with all these rules and regulations. Christ's blood will cleanse the heart and bring life to all the nations. For the holy place, take wooden boards, cover them all with pure gold. The incense and the candlestick will bring sweet light and keep out the cold. In time to come, the fragrance will be the prayers of all the saints. The spirit will shine throughout their lives and show the world that they're my mates. The holiest of holies is the tent's most sacred place. You must cover it with a veil because none can live who's seen my face. Make the art ark a mercy seat and on there I shall sit just once a year. The priest can come in, but he's to wear the robe and all that kit. For me to dwell among you, you must keep to my command. I'm holy and I can't tolerate sin, but I love you and won't do you harm. Don't worry, these things are just a shadow of the future and what's to come. The veil will tear and a way made to me through Jesus, my beloved son. So Moses obeyed and kept the commands. God dwelt with them there in the land. Fire by night and a cloud by day showed God held them in the palm of his hand. Today for us, there's a greater promise, a path straight to the heart of God. By his spirit within us, he lives when we accept Jesus as Saviour and Lord. Amen. Amen. Shall we just shall we just end with a prayer and um, I'll commit this to the Lord? Hallelujah, Father. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. We know that it is sin that has always separated us from you. We thank you that you made um, the ultimate sacrifice. You were the ultimate sacrifice, and Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, was crucified there on the cross. So that we don't need to go through all this ritual, all this palaver. We have a way straight to your heart through the covering blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.